Good afternoon. My name is Dan Justin. I work uh, in a little place called the Institute on the Common Good. I'll say something about that in a moment, but I'm gonna make this quick. Um, we wanted to time this so people could uh, bring their classes and we wanna get you out of here before you have to get to your next class. And we wanna save as much time as we can for Christian. Usually uh, you have to do two, three, two or three things. You gotta say thank you. Um, kind of say who is the speaker and why should you care about it. Um, I'll tell you why I care. Uh, but first of all, thank yous. Thank you to Ernie Duff. Uh, it's really weird when the Department of Homeland Security calls you. Um, and they did. And, uh, but especially, they, uh, Ernie is with the Office of Community Partnerships. Um, they reached out around um, different work. We work with interfaith dialogue, um, some work on combating extremism, which is part of how this opportunity came to Regis University. I want to say a thank you to the Denver Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, the Anti-Defamation League of the Mountain States, they've helped to make this possible to bring in Christian. Um, this happened months ago, and it couldn't be more timely. We had no idea how pressing these issues would be um, when this conversation started. Um, Christian, I, I'm going to let Christian tell his story uh, himself, because that is, um, that's going to establish his credentials for us. I'll, I'll just, I'm going to put in a plug. Uh, if you want to get deeper into it, there is a book. Um, it's an excellent one. I know that some of you are reading it in classes. Hopefully, um, it becomes a text that we use more often in the class, um, even just pieces uh, tracing the story and some understanding why I care and why I think you should. Um, the Institute on the Common Good, if you're familiar with us, a lot of our work is on dialogue um, and still making the case that there's a place for dialogue in our world. And it's a hard sell nowadays. Um, I find myself very often um, Trying, trying to say that it is still worth understanding people you disagree with. Um, and it is still worth having conversations where um, maybe nobody changes their mind at the end of it, but at least we can understand somebody. And it's, it's a hard sell. And I've, I've told people, I feel like, if we're going to make this case around issues like extremism and white supremacists, it's, it's a really hard sell. Um, but I think it's... it's it's work that's worth it. It's work that we'll continue to do. And so uh, if you want to track us down on the Institute on the Common Good, if you're interested in this kind of work, um, it has a home here on campus. We'll continue to do that. But for now, help me in welcoming Christian Picciolini. <laughs> Thank you very much. Forgive the Madonna microphone. And if I start voguing really quick, it's a little weird. Uh, Thank you, Dan. I really appreciate the intro. Um, I'm just going to get into my story because I would like to take you through my journey, uh, which began 22 years ago uh, when I left America's first neo-Nazi skinhead group in America. I was 22 years old at the time, uh, but I had already spent eight years, every single one of my teen years, uh, as part of this organization where I was taught to hate and I taught others to hate as well. Um, but before that, I was a pretty normal teenager. Um, my parents came to the United States in the mid-1960s uh, from Italy. They were immigrants. And when they settled here in Chicago, not here, uh, they had to work extremely hard to make it. Harder, I think, than most people who had been here a while. But they managed to open up a small uh, business, but that kept them away from home seven days a week, 14 hours a day, and I never really saw my parents. Um, I was raised by my grandparents and aunts and uncles, and every night my parents would come pick me up after work, and they would bring me to a different suburb. The suburb where my grandparents lived was mostly an Italian neighborhood, where many of the people that came from the same villages that my family came from lived. Uh, and I really enjoyed that growing up. I enjoyed being around people that I knew, felt very comfortable. Uh, but when I was born, my parents moved us to a suburb outside of this neighborhood that was not diverse. It was very white, for lack of a better word. And I never really fit in into either community because the Italians saw me as the outsider who left, uh, and the kids in the other town saw me as the foreign kid. So growing up, I never really had any friends. I was bullied. I felt 
marginalized and disenfranchised. Um, and I was really looking to do something greater than myself. I just had no idea what that was. And I hit a lot of snags along the way because I was searching for three very fundamental human needs, identity, community, and sense of purpose. And one day, when I was 14 years old, uh, I was standing in an alley, and I was smoking a joint. And a man drove his car down that alley, and it was spitting up rocks and gravel, and it screeched to a halt six inches from where I was standing. And he got out of the car, and he had a shaved head, and he was wearing boots. And the year was 1987. Nobody knew in America what a skinhead was. And I was 14 years old standing in this alley when this man came up to me and he pulled the joint from my mouth and he looked me in the eyes and he said, don't you know that that's what the communists and the Jews want you to do to keep you docile? I was 14, I didn't know what a communist or a Jew was and to be honest, I didn't know what the word docile meant either. <laughs> <laughs> but this man was much older than me. He was 26 years old and, and uh, he seemed very smart and frankly, he was one of the first people that ever paid attention to me at that age. And he started out by saying things that didn't raise any red flags for me. He asked me what my name was. I said, you know, very nervously, Christian Picciolini. And he's like, oh, that's Italian. I said, yeah. He said, well, you should be very proud of that. Your ancestors were great warriors and thinkers and artists. And I said, yeah. Uh, and, you know, I was proud of being Italian. And he said, well, you have to be careful because there are people that want to take that away from you. I didn't quite understand what he meant, but I kept coming back to that alley, which was the birthplace of the American neo-Nazi skinhead movement on the southwest side of Chicago. And I would ride my little red bike up and down that alley, and I'd get closer to just kind of hang around with them, and then eventually they'd send me to get you know, beer and cigarettes from the store when you could still do that when you were 14 with a, a forged parent's note or whatever. And uh, they drew me in, they became my family. Um, and by that time, I had learned to dress like them. I had learned to speak like them. Uh, I had started to learn how to recruit and pass out literature. I still didn't really understand the, concept, the concept of what they were teaching me, uh, but I thought that they were smarter than me. I was just a 14-year-old kid who had you know, lived on the fringes for those first 14 years and not ever really establishing myself anywhere. So I was really just happy to belong. I wasn't raised with racism. It wasn't part of my family DNA. Uh, in fact, my parents were the victims of prejudice when they came to this country, and they always had an open door policy. We always had people visiting from other parts of the world, from different religions, uh, and I never really thought twice about that. But when this man started to talk to me and, and the other people in this organization started to teach me what they knew, I felt really stupid and very naive that I had known this stuff all along. I started to really resent my parents and be angry at them because they weren't there for me. And then I really started to resent the fact that they were immigrants. And I didn't have a great relationship with my parents at that time. Not because of what they did, but because of what I did. I took my anger out on them. And because I took it out on them, I also took it out on other immigrants and people of color. By the time I was 16 years old, now two years into this movement, I was like the poster boy for this group. I'd learned how to do everything. Uh, you know, I wasn't just a 16-year-old kid. They, they started to include me in things that were you know, secret within the group. And then at that age, uh, something very unfortunate happened. Uh, the man who recruited me, Clark Martell, who was America's first neo-Nazi skinhead, uh, and all the older people had gone to prison for a very violent crime. They went to a female skinhead's apartment that was part of their group, and because they had seen her with a black guy at a bus stop, they kicked in her door, they pistol whipped her, left her for dead, but not before they painted a swastika on her wall with her own blood. Luckily, they were arrested for that, and they went to prison. Unluck unlucky for me, I was essentially the last man standing, and I took over leadership of this very infamous uh, skinhead group. 
by that time, skinhead groups had started to pop up all over the country. And always recognized this Chicago group as kind of the founding cell, if you will. So I already had a lot of respect because of that. And being put into the leadership position, from going to a place of complete powerlessness just two years before, when I was 14, to now a very powerful, quote unquote, respected position within this movement, it fed me with ego and with power. And I finally felt like I belonged somewhere. I finally felt like I knew who I was and what I was supposed to do with my life. Back then, I thought I was saving the world. I thought I was doing the right thing. And I thought everybody else was crazy, that they didn't understand what I was doing to protect them, to warn them about a white genocide that was happening because of multiculturalism. That's what I believed back then. So I started to think of ways to recruit more, uh, ways to find vulnerable young people, and I decided I was gonna start a band. Uh, not your normal band, but a racist band. And I started to write lyrics that were both neo-Nazi in nature, uh, and then also very conspiratorial in nature that also incited violence. And before I knew it, uh, because we were one of America's first uh, white power bands, uh, the kids started flocking to our concerts. We threw the best parties. We always had beer. Uh, and we started to recruit these young people who were also marginalized and vulnerable because at that age, which is really not that far off from maybe some of your age, that's when we break away from our families, our parents, and we want to build our own identity. We want to know who we are and where we belong and what our purpose is. And if there are voids in their lives, like for me, it was abandonment, and I call them potholes, the things in our lives that deviate our path from the one that we're supposed to be on. It could be trauma, it could be abuse, addiction, a broken home, a perceived grievance, mental, uh, mental illness, chronic unemployment, poverty, whatever the case may be, the potholes that change our direction. We looked for kids specifically that had potholes because we knew that we could promise them paradise. And if that sounds familiar, that's because it really is the same across all different types of extremism. It's about promising you, promising you the answer to your perceived problem by blaming somebody else, by saying it is the other's fault. And we blamed everybody but ourselves. We blamed blacks, we blamed Jews, we blamed immigrants, Latinos, gays, Asians, you name it. We even blamed white people who were not on our side. We never blamed ourselves, even though we were the ones causing our own problems and causing problems in our communities. But we would specifically target young people who were looking for something but didn't have that support system or had those potholes because we could then promise them that paradise that would get them to belong to our organization. And for a while, we would give them what they were missing. We would give them an identity. They were not you know, these kind of throwaway kids anymore. They were part of this you know, strong unit. They were part of a family, so they had the community. And their purpose was bigger than them. It was to save the white race because we would make them afraid that that would go away. And to a lot of these kids, that's really all they had. <clears throat> I spent eight years from the time I was 14 until I was 22 doing this, until my life started to change a little bit. I started to grow up and get influences from people that I had met along the way. When I was 19 years old, I met a girl and I fell in love and we got married and we had our first child and then at 21 had our second son and they were not a part of the movement. I never wanted to get them involved. In fact, my wife hated it that I was involved. Every day she tried to get me to pull away. But I couldn't because I was afraid of losing all that I had because I remembered what it was like to not have anything at 14 years old. So I didn't want to give up this identity because it made me feel powerful. 
and I was scared of feeling powerless again. I didn't want to give up my family, even though I had a new one, one that was really mine. And this purpose, I didn't know, aside from that, what else I would do. But having that child and having that family challenged those narratives. Was I this racist leader, or was I a father and a husband? Was my community the one that I had manufactured around me that was destroying me, even though I didn't see it at the time? Or was it my wife and children who really needed to be there? Was my purpose to you know, start a race war, or was it to raise a family and be a good example for my children? And that began to change my narrative. But I was still not brave enough to, di to disengage completely. So as my wife was trying to convince me to leave, I compromised with her and I said, okay, well, I'll step back. I won't go out on the streets anymore. I won't cause any more violence. Instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open a small record store so that I can sell white power music and not disengage, but I'll keep the family safe by doing that and I'll be able to support the family. Well, it took a lot to convince her to do that, but she finally let me do that. And very quickly, the store uh, was selling a lot of this white power music. This was before the internet, if you can imagine that. People, people were driving in from California and New York and Texas to buy the music, and it very quickly became 75% of the music sales. But I was also greedy, uh, and I wanted to be a good business person. So I started to sell heavy metal and punk rock and hip hop. And what happened next, I never would have expected. The people who came in to buy that music came in and they, they didn't break my windows. They didn't protest in front of my store. They didn't threaten me. Instead, even though they knew exactly what I was about and what I had done with my life, they came in and they showed me compassion. They showed me compassion when I least deserved it, and they were the people that I least deserved it from. These were African Americans, and they were gay, and they were Latino. And I started to humanize them. I started to have conversations with them because I'd always kept them outside of my social circle. I'd never had a meaningful dialogue or interaction with the people that I thought were different than me. But at the store, when these people came in, they found it in their hearts to empathize with me, to show me the compassion that I needed to drive out the demonization that I had of them and turn it into humanizing them. Because I'd never really given myself that opportunity. I hated these people and I really didn't have a reason. It was based on what I'd been taught and what I believed, but not based on reality. And I got to be very close with these people, and they became my friends. And in fact, I was closer to them than I was with the skinheads that I was still leading. So for a little while, I lived a double life. At the store, I was friends with the people who came in to shop for the music, and they would keep coming back. But when the store closed, you know, I would go do what I always did. I would ignore my family, and I would go hang out with the people that made me feel powerful. Eventually, I got to be very embarrassed about the fact that I was selling this white power music in front of these people who now I call very dear friends. So I removed it from the store, and of course, because it was 75% of my revenue, the store had to close. And at that same time, my world kind of fell apart. My wife and children left me because I hadn't disengaged quickly enough and they gave me too many chances to do so. I lost my livelihood when I closed the store. I didn't have a great relationship with my parents, even though they tried. And I lost the family that I had manufactured. And when I walked away from the movement, it wasn't just that I had to start over, but I had to dig myself out of a hole because no matter what I did, no matter how I tried, no matter how I treated people with respect, 
I was still branded that evil racist, rightfully so. I had to work very, very hard for very many years to gain that trust back that I destroyed. When I closed the store for five years, I went through a depression where I would wake up every morning and wish that my eyes hadn't opened, that I could just go back to sleep and never wake up. And I was in bad shape. I was treating other people with respect. I had friends of every race, every religion, but I was running from my past. I was too scared to admit to anybody who I used to be. I was scared of being judged the same way that I judged people. At the end of that five years in 1999, a friend, one of the few that I had, came up to me and she said, you're gonna die and I don't want you to die. And I said, okay, what do you suggest? And she said, well, I just started working at this company. It's a great company. Uh, you should go apply there. And I said, okay, well, what's the name of the company? And she said, it's IBM. And I was like, you're crazy. You know, <laughs> I'm an ex-Nazi. I have tattoos all over my body. Uh, I didn't go to college. I went to six high schools. I got kicked out of every one of them, one of them twice. Oh, and I don't own a computer. That probably is not gonna be good for this job. And she's like, well, just, just go apply. I'll put in a good word for you and tell them that you're really good with people. And I said, oh, okay, sure, <laughs> if you say so. Uh, and I went in for the interview. And I went in for another one, and they called me back for a third one, and I ended up getting the job. Uh, it was just an entry-level assistant job. But the first place that they put me out of all the millions of customers that IBM has, where did they put me? Back at my old high school, the same one I'd been kicked out of twice to install their computers and do their network, and I was like, oh no. <laughs> Here's the first thing in my life that means anything, and I'm gonna lose it. This, is, this was my lifeline. I know I'm gonna walk in and somebody's gonna recognize me because they had a restraining order against me years before. It's not like, you know, they were still talking about me at that school. I think they still are now. And um, I was terrified. I was at that point a grown man, and, and uh, I didn't know what to do. I was scared to go into work for my first day, like it was like first grade or something. And, uh, you know, when I got there, uh, I was like, you know, creeping around corners because I didn't want anybody to see me. And of course, because of karma or destiny or God's will, who walks by me? first day, within the first 15 minutes that I'm there. Mr. Holmes, the old black security guard that I got in a fist fight with that got me kicked out for the second time. I didn't know what to do. But I decided I was going to chase him to the parking lot. Probably not the best idea. <laughs> but I did, and when I saw him, he was getting into his car, and I tapped him on the shoulder, and when he turned around and recognized me, he jumped back because he was afraid. I didn't know what to say, I didn't know what to do, and all I could think to do was say, I'm sorry. And he put out his hand, and I shook it, and we talked for a long time. I think I probably almost got fired because I was like away from my station for too long. But he told me, that he forgave me. And I didn't even ask for it, I didn't know how. But he also made me promise something, and that was that I would tell my story to people because he recognized this wasn't just the story of some you know, kid from a broken home who lived on the streets, who ended up joining some you know, white supremacist group. This is the story of every vulnerable young person who is looking to belong. Who looks, for place, who looks for belonging in places that are negative because they've hit walls everywhere else, because opportunities aren't there to support their positive passions. And he made me promise that I would tell my story, and I promised, and I, and I didn't know how to do that. So for a couple of years, I kind of struggled, and I told a few people about my past and about the things that I had done and I was really relieved when they couldn't believe that the person I was describing was the person that was standing in front of them. 
And I knew then that I had to make amends for everything that I had done. And I started down a path where I sought out the people that I had hurt. I sought out the people that I had hurt by bringing them into what I was involved in, because I also destroyed a lot of lives that way. And eventually, in 2009, I co-founded an organization called Life After Hate. We launched a program in 2015 uh, called Exit USA, which is uh, a program to help people disengage from the movements, frankly, that I helped build. Since then, we've uh, worked with over 100 people who've disengaged just in the last two years. Uh, and the way we do that is not by going to them and arguing ideologically with them or battling or debating. When I work with somebody, I listen to them. I don't talk very much. I listen because I'm listening for those potholes. What deviated their path onto the one that led them to this white supremacist movement? And then my job becomes to fill in those potholes. I will find people job training, education, tattoo removal, life coaching, mental health therapy, whatever the case may be, because my goal is to make them more resilient human beings. If I tell them that they're wrong, which, trust me, I want to, that just pushes them farther away. And the reason that they've gone to these groups is because they've already felt marginalized, because they've already felt like they don't fit in and something was taken away from them, right or wrong. That's why they went there. And if I push them further away, that's gonna make them angrier, more violent. What I wanna do is I wanna work on the human. Once I do that, and I see that they're in a better place, they have more self-confidence, they're more resilient, they're doing positive things with their lives, that's when I will challenge their ideology and I'll immerse them with people that they think that they hate. I may take a Holocaust denier and we'll spend a day with a Holocaust survivor. Or somebody who is Islamophobic, we may spend a day with a Muslim family and have dinner with them. And those are the types of things that connect people that, because nine times out of 10, they've never had a meaningful interaction that allows them to dispel the prejudice now that they've been in contact and repeatedly over time, it's really amazing how these people can transform themselves through that. It's not magic. It's the same thing that happened to me at that record store. It's the same thing that happened you know, to the hundreds of people that I've talked to who've left the movement on their own or the hundred that I've worked with. It's fear. Hatred is born of ignorance. Fear is its father, and isolation is its mother. We fear what we don't understand. And if we're so isolated from it and afraid to interact with it, sometimes that turns into hate if the proper structure and support is not there. So my goal is to dispel the fear and bring people together, to understand that we have more similarities than differences. And I think that that's where we need to start. While it might feel good to punch a Nazi, it's probably not gonna change their mind. In fact, I think in the history of the world, no racist person has ever become an anti-racist because they got punched in the face. Okay, you know, I don't know the statistics behind that, but I'm, I'm willing to guess it's 100%. <laughs> but I can tell you that those types of actions make them angry or push them further away. What brings people back to earth, back to humanity, is finding a way to include them. As ugly as the things that they say are or do, if we're ever going to beat this, we need to find common ground and start with the similarities and then work our way out to the differences. Right now we're in a climate where we're starting with the differences, trying to get to the middle, but we never get past the differences. Let's start with the similarities. We're all American. We all want security. We all want to be able to support our families and provide a good education. If we can agree on those things, and I'm not saying we're gonna agree on the things that are on the extremes, but maybe we'll understand 
that we're more the same than we are different and we'll stop fearing each other. I think my time is up. I want to just leave you guys with a challenge. Because when I said compassion from the people that least deserved it, that I received compassion from the people that I least deserved it from when I least deserved it, I meant that. So I want to challenge you guys today is I want you to leave here after school or tomorrow or hopefully every day is find somebody that you come across that you think doesn't really deserve compassion or respect and I want you to give it to them because chances are they're the ones who need it the most. Thank you very much. So, at this point, you can already see a couple microphones floating around. We have some time uh, for some questions and answers um, and uh, the, for the conversation to flow wherever uh, we would like. But, sure. Yeah, I think we got 10 minutes, so unless you want to miss your next class, I'm okay with that. <laughs> Teachers might not be. You have some people here. And if you could just stand up, too, that'd be great. Hi, uh, I'm Angelo Nickley. Um, uh, I had a question about noticing the signs of when someone is starting to be recruited by sure. Nazis and uh, white supremacists. Because last year we had a student who started off in the year with some kind of hateful views, but in most just normal everyday guy. But over the year he kind of got looped into these kind of hate groups and Nazis and was kind of sucked into them and caused all kinds of controversy on campus. Sure. And I was wondering, what are like some simple signs that we can like notice in order to like reach out and try to offer people community before they lash out and hurt someone else? Sure. Well, that's what I do every day. My goal as an, as an intervener, uh, let's say, is to off-ramp people before they get to the point of violence, right? To, to give them an exit. Uh, before they get to that point. But I can also tell you that it's very hard to see the warning signs today because even 30 years ago, when I was involved, we recognized that the shaved heads and the swastika tattoos, it was turning off even the average American racist who we wanted to recruit. So we decided at that point that we were going to blend in, that we were gonna grow our hair out, that we were gonna trade in our boots and wear suits, that we were gonna go to college campuses to recruit and enroll there that we would get jobs in law enforcement, that we would run for office, go to the military, get training, and blend in. We wanted to look like the people and sound like the people that we wanted to recruit. We called it leaderless resistance, now I think they're calling it the alt-right, uh, but it's very hard to distinguish. Uh, some of the warning signs are the same uh, as if you know, a young person is getting into drugs, let's say their habits change drastically. They usually leave behind the things that they used to love to do, like their you know, friends, families, hobbies, things like that. Uh, of course, with, you know, with this movement here, you'll see a lot of uh, conspiracy theory talk, you know, denying of the Holocaust, uh, reading of certain websites online that are you know, what I would call fake news websites. Um, and the change in language. It might go from somebody who was not very confident to now somebody who's overly confident, uh, who's using language that, you know, maybe a year before they never would have gotten into that kind of stuff. It's hard to say. Not every person who becomes an extremist becomes a violent extremist. Um, and while I would love to change everybody's mind, we do live in a country where it's important that we have free speech. But I believe there are limits to that. I believe that when free speech turns into hate speech and it incites violence or terrorizes people, that's not free speech anymore, right? They can say that if they want in their houses, but if they say it to somebody else or it affects somebody else, that's not what America is. That's not what our, our idea of what our democracy and freedom is. Um, it's hard, it's harder, it's not hard. It's harder to tell, um, but it sounds like you already know some of the signs that that person was changing. And at that point, you know, engage with them if you want to, not in an aggressive way, not in an oppositional way, but in a way that tries to understand why they went down that path. 
because then it'll give you the clues on what they may need to get back on track. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, this sort of dovetails into that in terms of speech, and I think part of it may be that you were on the inside and you were familiar with a lot of this speech. You knew its sources, why, and what it was about. For those of us who don't have that privilege, um, I don't know if I call it a privilege. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but um, if if we're hearing the speech and the speech goes right to the core of us that's either afraid or offended or angry or, you know, you know, I want to punch out that speech, I want to eradicate it, how do you suggest getting, for those of us on the outside of it, how do you suggest getting beyond that speech, getting beyond its effect in us? That's always the hardest question I get because it's emotional. Right? When somebody says something and it's against everything that you believe in, your instinct is, I, I want to eliminate that from my site, from my city, from my country. Unfortunately, that's the same tactic that they use. And we can't adopt their tactics. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not a pacifist. If somebody attacks me, I will defend myself. If somebody attacks somebody that I love, I will defend them. But at the same time, I believe in holding people accountable for what they say, but not in an aggressive or violent way. You should tell them that they're wrong or that they shouldn't say that in your presence, right? Maybe not that they're wrong, but they, they shouldn't say it in your presence, that it's not acceptable, that's not what an American says or what a Coloradan, you know, is that the right word, Colorado, <laughs> yeah. would, would act like. Um, and again, just try and have an understanding of why they may say those things. What is missing? Let's face it, happy people don't go around, you know, driving their cars into groups of protesters. Happy people don't plant bombs. People who are whole and have a good foundation just don't do that. So there's something that led them to that point. Something, some grievance, something that was missing, uh, you know, a void. And I think we have to find, as, as humans, we need to find out what those things are. You know, I don't know the answer to solve racism. If I did, I would have won a Nobel Peace Prize. But what I can tell you is, we each have the ability to affect the people closest to us. Our friends, our family, our coworkers. And we have to do that in a compassionate way. And if we all do that, that's how we change the world. The most powerful thing I saw after Charlottesville was the protest in Boston where we saw 40,000 people peacefully surround two dozen neo-Nazis, it was a show force, it held them accountable, we know you're there, you see us, but we're also not gonna use the same tactics that you use, and that to me was the most powerful thing. I think we have maybe time for one more. Hi there, my name is Bruce. Hi, Bruce. Um, Kind of going off that, last, so just some background information. Uh, two summers ago, I was doing voter registration. Um, I had a conversation with a man, and I'd walk around with a clipboard, interact with people, and I had a conversation with a man who had a Confederate pin on his hat, and he seemed like very rational, and we had a nice conversation. And at the end of the conversation, you know, he didn't take his pin off, I didn't put his pin on me, but I felt like some of that like compassion you were talking about was like exchanged between the two of us. And you just said like uh, the importance of finding people close to you in your immediate circle to like have those interactions with. But what do we do for you know people who were like you when you were 14 who were on the outskirts and like I don't have a clipboard anymore. I don't have that like pretense of why I'm going up to you. Um, how how do you make that connection? with someone um, just on the street? Well, first of all, good job on doing that. I mean, that is the exact approach that I'm talking about. And I think that you probably did get through to him. You didn't change him, likely, but you made him think. And that's how it starts. Um, you know, for me, I really, I didn't, I was passionate. I was so interested in doing, you know, I would sit in my grandparents' coat closet and I would draw like architectural plans for hotels when I was 10 years old because I just was fascinated by that. Had somebody come to me and said, hey, you seem like you like that or you might be pretty good at that. 
let's see what we can do to foster that. You know, I think to a certain degree, uh, you know, adults are failing young people today. Young people want to be heard. They don't want to be talked to. Young people are smart. They're ambitious. They're idealistic. You guys know this. You're all in this room, and I'm talking about you. It's your time to change the world. You know, I, my time is over. Um, and we need to do more of that. We need to do more of that awkward conversation sometimes, but in a non-aggressive way, because we're so scared to talk about things, you know? We have to get to the heart of what the problem is, and that is a disconnection from each other. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I commend you for, for doing what you did, because it could have been easy for you to walk away or, you know, to give him the finger and, you know, whatever, but you didn't. You had a conversation with him, and now that person who may never have had contact with somebody like you before now realizes, well, maybe, you know, that idea I have in my head is, is not so bad. Uh, it's also very powerful that you are a stranger doing that and not somebody that he knew, because that, you know, is a little bit more powerful in my opinion. So, thank you. Thank you. I just want to say thank you again. Thank you to everybody for having me here, and, and uh, it's a beautiful campus. I kind of don't want to leave, uh, but I have to, um, and uh, go out and make the world a better place. Thank you very much. <laughs>